Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's talk title, The Shared Home, How Humans and Wildlife Thrive Together in the Penang Hill Biosphere Reserve. I'm May, your MC for this event, and I'm thrilled to be here with all of you. Before we proceed, let me introduce our three esteemed speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Anit Jayaram, a Deputy Director at the Center of Marine and Coastal Studies, CIMAX, University of Science, Malaysia. Dr. Annette is a Penang Knight who completed her postgraduate degree in USN and is currently involved in the aquaculture research team, which focuses on edible marine invertebrate species based in the CMAX USN. Her research team is working on nutrition requirements and behavior of the mantis shrimp, sea cucumbers, and mud crabs cultured in lab conditions. They are exploring the limitations and challenges of aquaculture to address food security issues. Alongside research, the team at CIMAX is very passionate on bringing environmental awareness to the public through outreach and education, especially on the threats of marine plastic pollution. Our second speaker is Dr. Ui Ying Hin, a research officer at the Penang Botanic Gardens Department. Dr. Ui is interested in tropical understory plants, especially arise and gingers. His past research has led to the discovery of a new genera in Beresi and several species in ginger Beresi. A genus Uya in Beresi was named after his surname to honour him. With a botanical research background on plant taxonomy, phylogenetics, floral biology and plant pollinator interactions, he has been contributing to the effort of reviving Penang Botanic Gardens as a truly functioning botanic garden since 2017. Next, our final speaker is Dr. Ahmad Zafir Abdul Wahab, the Program Director at the Habitat Foundation. Dr. Ahmad Zafir is a wildlife conservationist with extensive experience working on the conservation of large mammals, including tigers, elephants, and rhinos. He has been involved in conducting wildlife surveys, patrolling and enforcement work in Malaysian jungles, and is also a passionate communicator. Within Penang Hill Biosphere Reserve, he has been involved in research on the endemic species that are found here. And also our moderator for the day, Dr. Yang Kok Lee, who is the Senior Project Officer for the Biosphere Reserve Management Unit of Penang Hill Corporation. Please give them a warm welcome. Thank you. Without further ado, let us welcome our first speaker, Dr. Anit Jaya Ram, to present. Thank you. Okay, all right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, good evening to all of you. So, um, I'm Annette. I'm from Centre for Marine and Coastal Studies. This centre is under University Science Malaysia. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but sometimes some people, especially Penangites, they don't really know we exist because we are hidden inside the National Park in Teluk Bahang. So, I'm from there. Um, I guess today I will share a little bit about the marine environment. Um, we are all very familiar with very beautiful sceneries when you think about the sea, um, beautiful sunsets. So sometimes I myself wonder, do we think about what is below, what is under, what's beneath the waves? So that's pretty much what I want to share with everyone today. And looking at our country, we are actually surrounded by the sea. So Malaysia is a maritime nation. And most of the times when we talk about conservation, people always think about the land. Somehow, maybe this is a personal opinion, but we kind of forgot about our aquatic um, environment, right? So the sea and also the rivers sometimes gets left behind a little bit. So since we are talking about the Penang Hill Biosphere Reserve, so this is the, the map, right? So the total area is 12,000 hectares and the inland area is about 7,000 hectares and part of it also covers the marine. So the marine area takes up about 41.6% of the Penang Hill Biosphere Reserve. So. This is a view overlooking the area. Um, you can see some of our aquaculture sites. So there are, of course, human interactions um, with the nature, right? So 
like it or not, somehow there is going to be interactions. Positive or negative is a different thing. So we rely a lot on the marine area. So mainly it looks like we are looking at our economy. So we get our fisheries. Of course, our food comes a lot from the sea. Um, tourism, and then we have farming, so that's aquaculture. And then of course, one of the main functions is, it is life, all right? So it's place for different types of animals, different types um, of life forms, which actually rely on the marine area. So another thing that um, maybe we didn't learn in school, I'm not sure if they're doing it right now, but when I was in school, we were always told, Oxygen comes from the trees, right? So actually, we also get oxygen from the life from the sea. There are microalgae. They are pro producing oxygen for us to breathe. So not too sure if school syllabus have been updated now. Um, but oxygen doesn't just come from the trees, but we also rely on algae. Um, of course, tourism and recreation so many activities. So we are really very, very reliant on the sea. And also I would say we hmm, depend a lot, right? So it's a two-way kind of thing. So today I wanted to share something a bit different. Maybe you will not really think much about it. But this is a photo of my student. He's staring inside the pond. So when I ask him, what is he doing? You know, he's just sitting there and looking inside the pond. So you can see the pond is green, very green. So actually, he's, he, this guy studies algae. So he wants to just have a look what kind of different things he can see. Of course, you can't just see when you look like that. You will need the help of microscopes, right? So just now, Dr. Ahmad was saying that he totally hates lab work, doesn't want to look inside the microscope. Um, but it is essential, right? So if you're going to take a bit of that green colored water, put it inside the slides and look under the microscope, you will see a lot of things, right? So you will see many types of organisms inside the water. So some of them are really beautiful, all right? Different shapes, different sizes, and um, different functions. So basically, we have many types of life forms that we don't really see. So I just want to highlight, sometimes we forget the things that we can't really see, but they are there, just below the surface. And they are all functional and they have their own role, what they have to, you know, um, uh, um, they are all playing their part. So just to give you an idea what it looks like under the microscope, so, this is one of the species. So you can see them going around. So these are not animals. So they are basically plants. So they are single cell uh, life. So they are just moving around. So this is what you will see. And this is what Dr. Ahmad hates. We, we do the calculation based on the slides that we see. So just because we can't see them doesn't mean they don't play a role. They play a very big role. So all those, we call them phytoplankton or microalgae, right? So they are using the sunlight and then they are producing oxygen. And other than that, animals, smaller animals. So these are zooplankton, which rely on them. So they eat them. So these are part of a larger food cycle. So the phytoplankton get eat, get, gets eaten by the zooplankton. And then zooplankton are also food for smaller fish and you can see that smaller fish are part of the food chain so not only they become food for other bigger fish of course they are also part of our food security so sounds like phytoplankton are actually a good thing right um, but then look at this this is what happened recently um, around monkey beach near where our center is, you can see a lot of this pink color algae. Okay, so there's a lot, um, starts to get very thick. And then sometimes we read about this, right? Some things like this happen. Um, fish gills. So this happened in year 2019. 
um, nearby the fish cages in Teluk Baha. So out of the blue, all of a sudden, all the fishes started dying. So what happened was, during that time, there was a storm, um, the typhoon Lekima. So what happened was that typhoon churned up a lot of the things, um, the nutrients that is on the bottom of the seabed and it makes this area lacking in oxygen. So all the fish inside the fish farm, they are inside the cages, they cannot escape. Their area is low in oxygen, so they, they die. Right, so phytoplankton bloom sometimes can be a bad thing. And you have also heard about the uh, um, fishes, oh no, sorry, the shellfish especially. Sometimes you can get poisoning, toxic shellfish poisoning. So it is because of these tiny microorganisms that is inside of their, their shells. So when there is high bloom, um, this could possibly happen. So, going on from the small tiny things from the sea, I want to share about things that people get really excited about. I'm not sure about you, but these are something which I, I always get really excited to see. So in Penang, we do get dolphins. Not many people know about that. I see you looking quite surprised. But there are four types of marine mammals that we can get. Um, around um, Penang. So this is some of them. Um, the first one is the Indo-Pacific humpback dolphin. And then we get the Irrawaddy dolphin. And if you notice, this particular species is vulnerable. And the Irrawaddy dolphin is endangered. And the two other species that we get are the Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphin and also the finless poppers. So, one is near threatened and one is vulnerable. So I'm assuming that most of you are Penangites. So have you actually seen the dolphins around Penang? No? Any one of you seen? Yes? From afar. Okay, you're lucky. So working in the marine center, I get to go to work by boat every day. So it's either I take the boat or I hike in. Of course, I want to take the boat. I don't want to walk that 30 minutes. <laughs> Save time, okay? <laughs> so I always look out and see if there are anything like dolphins passing by. So whenever we see something, you get really excited. So this was um, in the Star newspaper last year. There are some dolphins which were spotted in Batu Fingi. And these are some of the videos that we took that I want to share. If you can see. So there are some here. This is in Tanjung Bunga and also in Teluk Baha. So there's some swimming around. So it's really nice to see animals like this um, swimming in our waters. So these are the charismatic spe species that people think about when they think about marine environment. No one really thinks about the tiny ones, but they are still there. Yeah. But I will share with you the other side. Um, which is not very nice. So this is another dolphin sightings, um, which we, we actually went to see. So this one is a carcass of a finless porpoise in year 2021. So I think we've come across at least three to four plus year, if I'm not mistaken. CMAX, we don't really work on this, but people do call us and inform us there are, um, you know, carcasses found in the beach. So we will actually help to inform the fisheries department because we are not allowed to collect samples. It's against the law. So we have to inform the fisheries. But this is really sad, right? Looking at, at um, dolphins getting washed up. So potentially it could have been, you know, tangling by fishing nets or sometimes by boat. Um, it gets injured. So things like this do happen. So these are the threats that humans actually pose to animals. It is something that we all know it is happening, but somehow we have to find ways to, to stop that. This is another picture that I took in Monkey Beach. So very beautiful, very scenic. Somehow when you walk um, at the beach, you can see all sorts of plastics. So. The plastic pollution issue is also a very big, big thing right now. So plastic 
was invented for a good cause previously, right? I think it was in 1948 or 1950s. Plastics were produced and you can use them in the medical field, um, many different areas. But I think the problem happens when we overuse them in forms of single-use plastics. So we use them one time, we throw away, and we just forget about it. So this is another photo um, to show you small, tiny pieces of plastic. So there are about like 300 pieces in this particular photo. And it was taken from the stomach of a bird. Yeah, so it is said that our birds, uh, seabirds like this albatross, has been actually consuming plastics because they can't differentiate their food. Um, and when plastics is washed up on the sea, it gets covered by algae. So the smell smells like food to them. They eat it, but they cannot digest. So it gets stuck in the stomach and they eventually die because they don't get the nutrition that they need. So this is another type of food cycle now. So there's plastic. So plastics gets broken down. All the big plastics that throw, we throw away, it gets broken down and these are a new thing. Microplastics. We can't see them, but they exist. So there are many research going on um, about plastics in our marine environment. So what happens? Remember the plankton that I talked about just now? They actually consume those microplastics and it's within their food system. And then the fish eats them and comes back to us. So I don't know how much plastic is in my own tummy at the moment, but I'm sure there are. There are researchers um, currently being told that they can find plastic in human feces, there are plastic in our bloodstream, there are plastic in the placenta. So it is getting more and more prevalent nowadays. And other than that, um, just to highlight to you that a lot of changes are happening um, around us. We are all familiar with the term climate change. Um, especially in the marine area, what is happening is that the ocean is getting warmer. Um, this is going to affect all the different organisms in the sea. Okay, things are getting hotter and oxygen is getting less. And also the water is getting more acidic. So when it's more acidic, animals like shellfish, they find it difficult to make their shells. Alright, so not, not the right condition for them. So with all these things happening, I know we cannot, we can't fix everything, but we can do something in our own way. So I just want to introduce a little bit about what our centre does. Um, we work on research, we do education, um, we work with the community around us, we work with quite a number of schools, um, we work with different um, communities. So we get them either to come to our centre, come for programs, um, especially children. They get very, very excited because we have marine organisms at our center. I think nowadays children, or maybe even adults, we hardly really see the animals and we get to touch them. Always on the phone, right? So always looking at YouTube, but you don't know what's the real animal. And this one time I was walking in Taman Negara, I heard the kid shouting at the mom, Mommy, chicken, chicken, never seen chicken before. So, this is something we, it's not in our mind, but for me it's like, wow, it's a reflection. When I was growing up, this is normal, but now it's not. So, very, very different. Yeah, so these are some of the schools that we work with. We did some workshops, um, all just to create more awareness. Um, and we also work with the public, we call it the Citizen Scientist Program. So there are three different programs that we do. And the other that is coming up soon, somewhere in September, is the International Coastal Cleanup Day. So what we do is we actually organize beach cleanups. Besides that, we teach people how to do it themselves. So we run this for an entire month. Because of the pandemic, we have to be creative. Before this, we just did the beach cleanup activities, um, teaching people how to collect data. Not only collect rubbish, but also collect data. So we know what type of plastics is out there. 
So during pandemic, we also found masks, we, saw, we found gloves, so many different things. And one of the major things we found is cigarette butts. So if you didn't know, cigarette butts do contain some filaments of plastic inside. So they will break down into microplastics eventually. Um, this is some of the data that we have. So this was in year 2021. We will organize another one this year. Um, I will share that in our social media later on. This is another special place that I want to highlight. It's called the Gazumbo Island. Penangites, do you know where is this island? If you are driving on the Penang Bridge, heading towards the mainland, if you look on the left, there's a small tiny island. So this is called Gazumbo Island. So CMAX, we actually run some research over there. And it's full of many different marine life forms. And this is called the middle bank. Okay, so beyond the Gazumbo Island, there is a patch of seagrass bed. So when it is low tide, we can actually walk in that area. So you can find many types of animals. Um, we do monitoring to see the different types of life, um, marine life that we can find in this area. Another thing is that the Penang State Government is actually going to gazette this area as the Middle Bank Marine Sanctuary. So this is a very important place to protect because it is the last seagrass bed um, in the Straits of Malacca. So a lot of life and also even humans, a lot, a lot of fishermen go to that area, catch fish and things like that. So this place is very important. But to show you something that you cannot see from the Penang Bridge, when you get to that island, the Gazumbo Island, it's full of trash, full of plastics. So the plastics from land gets washed up and it gets collected in that area. So we have done a few cleanups in that space, but after you clean a little while, it still looks the same. So a lot more needs to be done in this particular area. All right, so I think my time is almost up. Um, I just wanted to share with you just a little bit about the marine life and probably um, just to get you to you know, think about things that sometimes we don't see, but they are there. And to make a difference, sometimes it has to be in our own way, in our own capacity. So what we can do, um, we try our best to do that. All right, so thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, welcome. Uh, I'm Oin. Uh, today I'm going to share a little bit on uh, the activities and the function of our gardens. Maybe some of you may already know more about that because uh, it's not much different than from my previous one, but uh, this one was more to the activities as uh, request by the uh, organizer. Uh, you all, uh, most of you may uh, not know that Penang as organizations is actually start much earlier than the uh, current Penang Gardens. So actually it start at the seventeen ninety four. Then uh, the current one is uh, from eighteen eighty four. So this is this one. Previously. Uh, when British was first here, they most uh, concerned about economic important plant. What are the plants that they can plant here, they can bring it here to grow and then to use for the human? Then uh, they do a lot of research on this. Uh, some many, these two are the medicinal plants, some are food plants like avocado, orange, uh, coconut. They not only here, they also try in Penang here, here, the uh, Bell Reddy Road, eh, near the, or the nursery there. Yeah. Then they also want to know what we have in Malaysia when they first come here, what they can use. So they try to research on what the plant we have here. Then they check uh, what are the uses that local people been using for the plant. So these are the so there's a research that they do. So uh, for this research of solve, <coughs> of course for any plant research we need proof. Uh, so they will do collections, they will do drawings. Then they will keep in our aquarium. So this is part of where the research are. Then of course the research are not many people talk plant are just many so that fruit plant actually it's not also for the recreational part of the plant like the uh, roadside plant for the shade like the landscape plant for the beautify the area. So this is also under the research of botanic garden last time. So botanic garden also come a second the come the. Second function for the garden for the recreational. But nowadays, 
we need to think about this. We need to ask ourselves. We seen British and until here we always ask the most uh, popular question that I got is, uh, what is this one? Now what is use, it used for? Then did we ever ask ourselves that what our use, uh, what is the uses of, uh, what are the uses of human to the nature? We never ask. So nowadays, botanic garden also play as a function of conservation. So uh, we are lucky that they enlarge the botanical area. Actually, now we have 242 hectares uh, surrounding forest is under botanic garden. So that will be the become the conservation area. So we hope next time all these plants will all survive uh, in future. Uh, yeah, like the not the <laughs> story. Uh, I also found last time this is the palace farm, you know, palace that people been used for the ketupat one, you know. and then that day we we got one Malay student uh, when we bring a student when we I talk a lot, they so surprised all oh, this is. <laughs> They don't know this come from the plants. <laughs> they are so surprised, so similar to your chicken story. Uh, then when we protect all these plants, all the forests, of course everything other else will come. You see this uh, uh, real plant that we look like for virus also have, you see. Then these are uh, the seed of the Apocinaceae, uh, Anodendron. Uh, so this is not a plant, this is the fungus also is there, earth star fungus then the animals of course in the forest uh how are you okay also i will food friend sometime come in so i hope these are the thing that when we conserve the area so hold all the wildlife that will be conserved as well then uh here comes the spot function like i say the students are so nowadays the generation are so detached from the nature you know our human are so detached from nature so Botanic garden for function currently is of, for education. So it's uh, for connect back people to the nature. So we are indirectly with the label or directly we do the activities with the students. Uh, so these are the four main, main functions. That's why uh, then I go to a bit more detail to uh, what uh, I do uh, in the garden for my part. Actually, um, our garden has many, many parts. So uh, many, many units. Uh, so actually, uh, I'm in here, the unit botany conservation, uh, botany and conservation. Then we have maintenance team, then about 66 people. Then the Bahai Martan, the admin part, about nearly 20. Then our part, about 10. Then the, this Alam uh, Sakina, about uh, 3. So these are some of the ongoing activities. Uh. Uh, I did this now also. I, I won't go all up because too many. Like, <laughs> just some of it important. Like, I, we do that what British do 100 years ago to still keep our records of our plants. So this we make the specimens. Uh, we make specimens from a plant. For example, this is a rare, rare uh, tree in uh, Malaysia. So this one is finally flowering that day. So we take a specimen record so people know uh, this is a a uh, plant we have is a, a lime, they call ghost lime. <coughs> then this one is uh, people always mistaken it for another two species. So I uh, will also make a specimen so next time people can see, uh, understand that. So this is for uh, we also go to other places to do the record. So some other plant in the wild, in other forests, not uh, not only in Penang. So we also take from. Uh, so after taking back from the forest, of course, it's not you just leave it to die. No? <laughs> no, it, it already died anyway. I mean, leave it to rot. La. So we have to do the management. So we they need to curate it. La. So uh, we have three types of specimen, herbarium spirit. So this is why we need to keep the vouchers specimen safe. So this is not I'm talking like this guy talking, this editor talking. He, so I quote his sentence so committed to the maintenance that's one important so we try to curate our specimen so next time hopefully another hundred years people still can see what are the plants that we have then uh, like this this is before and after we try to uh, curate then sometimes the old drawing you can see this august 1900 so already put up already bro all broken so we have to puzzle back some more so this one is after curated. 
we make it back. This is paper restoration. Of course, also for living plants. Living plants we get from the field also outside. So uh, we try to grow in our nursery. Uh, these are some of the plants that we get from Penang here. Then this is from the Bukit Pancho Penang. Then this one is from Bukit Mataja. So we try to grow back uh, the plant so then in future this plant will be safe with us and then with record is very important because we have all these records so in case it's gone in the wild we can put it back if we can hopefully like that's uh, like this one that I just say uh, the Hangwana from the Penang here so. but after bring back it's not just simply put it away so there's a process also uh, we propagate it we germinate it then there's also the maintenance involved in terms of the plant, in terms of the system, the facilities. So in this part, I need to touch about something that uh, sometimes people uh, like to take the plant from the wild and then go back. Uh, and then because I, found, I met some friends or something, they just pluck, pluck, pluck and then they say, oh, this is so cute, they bring back. And then after that, they just forgot about it and die. So you can don't just simply take the plant. Also, don't steal the plant from our garden. It happened before. Also, people steal the plant from our garden. You can you, you try to spread the you, uh, message that don't simply tell. Is that a lot of things work to do to make all this survive in the in the plant houses? Uh, oh, so, oh, I made a small more mistake with the spelling. Then. Uh, eventually, what the plant inside the garden, the tree, right, the tree and the plants, we try to check it back because previously they, they are record cannot match back already. So we make a new record. This is our IC of the plant. Then uh, we check what each plant gives them. IC gives them number. Then we ID back and then uh, we keep the record nowadays. Uh, so people can uh, know also what we have in the garden. In case want to do research, on it, they ask us what we have, so we have uh, also the orchid house going to open soon. Then uh, this example, uh, the previous record is wrong, so when you flowering, we update back. Uh, so uh, same with everything in the thing. Previously, they do uh, uh, inventory or so, but because they cannot match back already, nobody know. They say number one is this species, and then you go, got. 103 of this species, which is number one, don't know. Uh, so maintainer is very important. So we put it there. And then here I need to charge a issue that got people go fear the tech is so painful to the plant and they go to plug it and then they cause more da damage. Uh, because the tech we use is sterile, is uh, stainless steel. And then we drill. You imagine your piercing of the ear, do you die because of piercing? Some people have 100 piercing on your body and then no problem, right? I might in the effect got nose piercing somehow, they didn't die. <laughs> so the, our tech is very small uh, as compared to the plants. Uh, then this is uh, a bit modern, uh, no, no longer 100 years ago. So we do the database uh, for those things that I explained. So we try to keep all digital now also. Then update the data. So you can see the trees in the map. Uh, when we want to find very easy, then we do this a bit uh, recording, so extra recording for the severe phenology when they flower, then they uh, fruit things. So this one also keep for record for the uh, education purpose. Then planting labels, I just how I mentioned one the labels. I uh, want to say this label because our site is very poor internet connection, so we don't need internet. This one just scan and get the text. Then uh, we have also normal small labels, labels and samples. Uh. Then I uh, need to tell about this is uh, you can see the root is here, right? If you see the mouth and all the leaf litter, some people thought leaf litter are dirty, want to throw it all. They complain to our management, ask them to throw it all. It's not dirty. Out, if you remove, take it, the leaf out, you will see all the root and then the soil are very fertile. The root hair come out. So these are the root hair that actually hold the ground and make the tree healthy and so hold out prevent the erosions. Uh, because the light here is all very hard to see. Uh, sorry. <laughs> then we do VTA. This is part where we helping other unit like, supposed to maintain and to do, but we also have to check the the health health of the tree. Uh, 
assess their hazardous or not. No, sometimes look healthy, but actually already rot below, so we have to report to them. So if our 900 tree went around the uh, whole garden. We do two rounds, second now we do the uh, root side only, the uh, inside the center garden. Only. So we update to the we update to the management, no? then they will take actions eventually. Then uh, environmental activity, this one also we helping the unit. Like I said, we got unit environmental, so the school, so try to, we have garden tour, then we have activities with the plant uh, craft. Then, uh, hopefully next time they are comfortable with the wildlife and animals uh, in future. Uh, okay, we can teach people to catch snake, but no, this is a not teaching, uh, just so we need to be comfortable with our nature. Then we do the uh, pest control, this one is also helping. We don't want to use too much pesticide, so we use a trap. Trap to trap the weevil. These weevil are very evil to the bum. They always eat until the bum die. They, they lay the baby, the baby will eat the bum, uh, the soft part, the new part of the bum, the shoot. So the bum will die. So we don't want to... Actually, chemical more effective. You just spray and uh, drenching, uh, they call soil drenching and then the, the thing died. But it was very dangerous to people, dangerous to our, uh, sorry, our animals. Uh, here very hard to see, actually got the monkeys here eating the, the our thing side. So the farm, and also other animals that eating, you see our tree. So this one is the lemur here. But the light is very disturbing here. Then, uh, so we don't want to poison our animals also so try to save them so we try to reduce the use uh, that's why we use a tag and this one i need to touch the issue that about if you can tell your friend oh don't feed the monkey don't feed any wild animal they have plenty of food they are uh, you see this one they eat the flower this one they eat the termite even termite they eat so they have to control the termite also the beetle that i mentioned they also eat so actually a lot of the thing they can eat uh, these are the people misunderstand. And then sometimes the plant also need them to spread the seed. They eat the food, the food. <laughs> and then the, seed, the new plant come out somewhere. So this one is very important. Uh, of course, we, we see on another side, we're helping the researcher to do the things if you want. And we help other organizations to do their energy. So hopefully in future, we will continue to contribute to the effort of conservation. No? Not only like this, now I'm helping the if you are uh, UNESCO Biosphere, when I'm here, so next time maybe we will uh, nation body and in future maybe the international one we also see and uh, helping. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uwi. Next, finally, our last speaker, Dr. Ahmad Zafir Abdul Wahab. Hi, good afternoon. I hope everyone's okay, everyone's awake. All Penangai, Penangai's here, I guess. All Penangai. Anyone from elsewhere? Any other state? Tada, all from Penang. Okay, good. So today, okay, today you'll learn more about Penang. <laughs> today I'll share about any wildlife that can be found on the hill. But not many of us, even though Penangai, we know the existence of this species. But also some way to take care of this species. Huh? Okay, so ensuring appropriate actions in conserving native wildlife of Bukit Nera, Pulau Pinang. Okay, I'm uh, Ahmad, and then my friends will help me with this presentation. I am Sharil, a, a guy who works with PBA, but he loves nature, he loves the outdoor, uh, and also very good with photography. And then we have Muin, who's a scientific officer from USM, who's helping with this presentation. 
we all know uh, Bukit Bendera is very rich with wildlife. That's why we got the recognition by UNESCO uh, to become a biosphere reserve. Okay? Keeping Bukit Bendera well, nice, beautiful is a priority. But we also need to ensure that the activities that we conduct, uh, beautifying, landscaping, tourists, tourists walking around, jungle trekking, all these activities are harmonious nature and wildlife that are found here. So everyone has a responsibility to make sure that all these native wildlife that are found here survive to the future. And also the plants, yeah. Which plants? So actually, without knowing, a lot of secretive wildlife can be found around us on camera. Even maybe sometimes just down there, just very near to us, just we don't see them. Okay? And even in areas where with human presence, people are walking by, but then they're just on the side of the trail. Okay? Some are endemic, meaning there are nowhere else to be found except here in on, except in Penang. And some are even more special. Even in Penang can only be found on these few hills. Uh, Western Hill, Tiger Hill, Las Bana, and nowhere else in the world. So it's so special. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there are also plants that are very special to Penang and to be found nowhere else. Okay, some of the species, okay, now just the names, the little I'll show you the photos. The Penang banded gecko. Uh, you can only see them at night. Siang, you will never see them. But if you follow uh, KP Ong, walking at night, he can show you the species. Okay, uh, this is only found in Penang. Then the Penang rock gecko. Yeah, also, yeah, the Penang as well, only Penang. The black female tarantula, yeah, only here. The Asian tarantula, Kilobrachis. They were not even properly described yet, the Kilobrachis has been Penang. They're only found in Penang. And then we have trapdoor spider, ah, okay, the trapdoor spider, yeah, can be found elsewhere, but it's very special. And then number six is Penang Hill Vampire Crab. That is the most weird animal, I would say. Uh, it's my, from based my, of my experience dealing with animals. Okay, first, the Penang Bandit Gecko, this is how it looks like. Normally at night, you can see in rocks, lubang lubang, there you can see it. The Penang Rock Gecko. Penang Rock Gecko can only be found on granite boulders. Only in Penang. Tarantula uh, can only uh, only come out at night, but normally by trails along the trail you can see them. Trapdoor spider is very special. If you don't know how to look for them, you will never be able to see. <laughs> you don't know this. There's a trapdoor spider punya lubang on on the side of the trail. You will never know. Very special. Okay, nicely camouflage. The black female tarantula. Uh, that's also. So we have. We actually have three tarantulas in Penang. The Asian tarantula, the black female tarantula, and also the Malayan tiger. These two tarantula, more of the, they stay on the ground, on uh, on embankments by the side of the trail, and then the tiger, the tiger, the Malayan tiger. Sorry, the Malayan tiger is more of more of uh, stay on trees. They find lubang on trees and then they stay there. So you, it's very hard uh, for you to see them. I've never seen them here. I've never seen them. I've seen them elsewhere. Lah. Uh, and then there's the most special one, Penang Hill Vampire Crab. I think most of you would know would know the species. Lah. The Penang Hill Vampire Crab was only found in 2016. Researchers have been coming to Penang Hill from 1790s. Eh? They recorded all the animals, they recorded all the plants, but weirdly, weirdly, nobody found this Penang Hill Vampire Crab. The first time, when I first started working in Penang Hill, I met Ayem, the Ayem Musharil, the PPA guy. He said he once found the crab, he was on a motorbike, yeah? he was on a motorbike on the hill on Summit Road. It was a rainy day, it was raining heavily. 
something dropped down a uh, drop fell off from the tree above him from the canopy fell on, onto his bike his motorbike and then it was the crab it was the penang hill vampire crab it was actually up in the canopy maybe in the trees maybe some there's a lubang on the tree there's some water stagnant water so the crab stayed there in that lubang on the tree so in malaysia there are not many places that have crabs that stays in trees and they're also special because they can only be found 700 meters above sea level only and now when dr net talk about the world is getting warmer okay so for other animals they can go find a maybe cooler place but for things in Pinahi, in Bukit Benera, we are, the higher, our highest elevate, our highest point is 835 meters. So if the temperature gets warmer, and this ketam, this small little ketam, where can they go? Nowhere, because just the range is. And then how many hills are they found here above 700 meters? Not much. So if we don't take care of the environment, we don't take care of the greenhouse gases that we emit, we might, you know, when the temperature rises, so this species might be gone, <laughs> yeah, yeah, along with the other species that are very limited, has very limited distribution. So as I was mentioned earlier, so we can find them. Yeah, so on Pinan Hill actually you can find them in by along bypass, along trails, uh, hiking trails, you can find them. That's why people sometimes they don't care because actually it's just ah, I don't see to some for some people. But then because of them being found near to us, also make this species have faces trouble lah. Trouble from people who doesn't know that this they these tarantulas, this crab, this chicha living there. The first photo is uh, the trapdoor spider. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a trapdoor spider's nest. Yeah, you wouldn't know. If <laughs> no one told you, you uh, that is look like just some paw or something just on the, on the on the side of the trail. And the other two lubang are where tarantulas are found. However, okay, having all these species, all these nice species, but they always threats to them. First, the landscaping activities that have been conducted on the hill by anyone. I'm, I'm not pointing to anyone, either from farmers, either from bungalow owner. Okay, so because yeah, people want to things to look nice. Okay, so without knowing that, as an example, if who knows that there's some species living by the side here, people might just oh, I want to change it to red colored flowers. So just buang everything and you destroy the habitat of the wildlife. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's not just the, it's just the, not just the animals, but also the plants. Okay, you might you might destroy the habitat of a species without knowing that they are there. Besides that, the use of herbicides and pesticides because you want to make the area clean in your eyes. Okay, you want to be very clear. You think, oh, some people so oh, this, a lot of shrubs and snakes will come. Snakes will come. <laughs> But people are so afraid of snakes, they say, well, better clear everything so that snakes cannot stay there. Uh, but that's, that's not the case. Snakes are always more afraid of us than we are afraid of the snakes. Okay. Uh, then we also might accidentally destroy animal burrows and on slopes and embankments. When constructing new structures, make signboard, make new... Uh, we want to stop landslide, then just turn everything to cement slabs. Okay. And those are actually wildlife habitats. So these are some of the photos that can be found on the hill. What's happening? Yeah, people are using pesticide to clear, to clear the shrubs. And then replacing, clearing the vegetation to plant this non-native. I don't know who it was this, but non-native, right? Uh, non-native. So people clear this patch, and this area is normally where the tarantulas. The trapdoor spiders and sometimes where the bandit gecko are found as well. Same here, the uh, creeping Charlie, creeping Charlie, purple. Ah, uh, uh, just the, uh, a lot of. 
besides landscaping and construction, the native wildlife of Bukit Benera are also threatened by poaching. Yeah, people come and poach the tarantulas. They have been recorded in 2019. So, we, I got a report, so I went there. Yeah, some people along bypass, I can't remember which bypass, but they correct the whole tarantula nest. Uh, because there's a high demand uh, overseas. Uh, research, we have a student who is doing research. He found this in German, our tarantula being sold in German. Uh, oh, Malaysia, everyone, everybody wants Malaysia, things from Malaysia, not just durian. Even tar our tarantula also they want to bring out. During MCO, bird poachers also come up to the hill uh, to poach for the Bairam Shama. Murai Batu, one well, that sings very nice. Uh, they come, uh, uh, they don't use the train, lah. they come from the back. Ah, this is very recent, 2023, just two months ago. If you can see the photos, the green photos are actually poison being used to kill rats and cats. I don't know why there's someone who create poison to kill rats and, and no, we know that there's a poison for rats okay that's that's common right but this one on the packaging it has a photo of a rat and also a cat and this guy is a farm okay this was found near a farm around the hill so this guy was trying to kill the i don't know whether trying to kill the monkeys the leaf monkeys or whatever coming so what happened is he put in the so this is the the poison the racun He's, and then this these are some this banana and chiku uh, he put some on the logs and also he put some in the plastic bag and hang it on the rotan in his area so what happened would be okay if he want to kill some i don't know he shouldn't be killing uh, first okay, if you have any problem should report to wildlife department to perhilitan okay but what happened is, this method, you may kill any, any animal that come and eat that fruit. So what would be eating that? You can kill the slow lorries, you can kill the macaques, you can kill the civets. Whatever animal that come and eat these fruits. Uh, pisang, of course. All the animals will love pisang and chiku, nice and sweet. So what do we have to do? If you are a business owner, if you are managing the hill, if you are, we have a bungalow on the hill, we need to make sure that landscaping activities do not adversely impact wildlife and do not, do not destroy the habitats they have found within our premise. Okay? And we need to consider facing out your use of pesticides and herbicides in whatever you do. And at the Habitat Foundation, we are ready to conduct, train, conduct training for anyone interested to know businesses or operation if you're interested to know how do you make sure that all these species survive on the hill how do you make sure that the contractors the the grass cutter the the, the bangladeshi guy that you employ to to clear to cut down the grass to clear the shrubs you know how to differentiate this the sites that he she should not touch or, he, or should not be left just like that okay and then, yeah, if you any of you see any illegal activities, poaching, hunting, people stealing plants or wildlife, do report to the Penang Hill Corporation. Okay, thank you. That's all from me. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad. Now that we have heard from all our distinguished speakers, we will have an open discussion session now. Feel free to ask questions and share your thoughts. I'll pass the floor to Dr. Yang. Hi, okay. So I'm Dr. Yang. I'm actually uh, in charge of the Penang Hill Biosphere Reserve. So after listening to all three speakers who are experts in their field, any questions? Except me, it's uh, from local, from uh, foreign state. I think all of you here are uh, Penang guides, right? <laughs> so, okay, uh, we have the first question. Thank you. I have two questions. Um, I'm Uncle Paul. People call me here Uncle Paul. So first question, I can't remember the name. Maybe to Dr. Ray. 
So about 20 years ago, I attended a seminar, something to do with the coast. Uh, we have a visit to your beach here, the office and the beach. At the time, one of your lecturer, professor, so you culture a lot of high value uh, self food, self macaroni and uh, mutiara and so on. But now, you cannot see anything there. You just have to know what happened. And they got the second question to the So, we used to, I, we used to, I used to go and attend to see many botanic gardens. Recently, I just came from Singapore, botanic garden. There's a whole heritage area. Cause no comparison. And I went to New Zealand, Auckland, uh, and Milton, Christchurch, and this one, Queenstown Garden also. Most of the garden have a pond here. People go there to relax, sit around. But the name Botanic Garden don't have. But never, that one never mind, I'm not complaining. The only thing I just want to ask, every time, most of people go there for exercise. But when I go there, I do I don't go for exercise. If I want to go exercise, I come to Canada. Just walk up here. I, I'm quite disappointed every time I want to go in some of your garden there, like orchid garden or bromelade garden and all this cactus garden. You cannot go in. The only garden I can go in, thank you very much. The only garden I can go in is your fern garden, which the men always open at the time. So I hope you can manage those, you can go in and look at all this bromelade and cactus and orchid garden and so on and many other gardens. You always look here, I cannot understand. Thank you. I pass the mic to Dr. Anne. You. Uncle Paul. Oh. Right. <laughs> My name is Anne. Yes, Anne. So, yes, thanks for the question. Our centre actually has been there since 1978. Yeah, so it's like 45 years now. So we will mention about the research that we do 20 years ago. Yes, you are right. Oysters, um, abalone. Actually, we still have this research. Um, at that time, our current director, Dato Aileen, was a student there. She was working on these oysters. So the research for oysters is actually ongoing during that period. And it was, I would say, one of our success stories because the oyster research actually can be translated to the community. So from that research, she has managed to work with different communities in Malaysia and they start their own oyster farm. So 20, 30 years of studies, um, I think this is a good thing about science. It doesn't just stay in the research paper. Sometimes scientists inside the lab you know, we do our field work, we just do everything, we send reports, and then that's that. We don't know what happens after that. But this particular research and more of the stuff that we're doing in CMAX right now, we actually want to take it further. We want to work with the community. So this is how science can actually help, um, especially those lower income um, fishermen. Um, one of the examples I can share with you is that now, instead of doing fishing, he is actually culturing these oysters. First, he starts as a part-time job. So he has a small farm. This is in Sungai Merbok, if you are familiar. This particular farmer, he's called Pak Su. So he actually now has just fully doing oyster farming. And then he has his own homestay. He's become a good businessman. I'm sure he's earning much more than me right now. Um, so it is part of the success that is because of the science, because of the research. And then another thing to share with you is that this oyster study actually has established one oyster hatchery in Penang, in Balik Pulau. Around the region, there are no oyster hatcheries. So it means they produce the seed, the babies. Before this, people used to go to the mangrove, they collect the oysters and then they start to grow them. But now you can actually get the seeds from this hatchery and then you can, you know, if you're going to do farming, you can actually start up your farm from these seeds from that hatchery. So this one is over a span of almost 30 years. So the research actually has developed a lot. 
Yes, we don't have the oysters outside. I'm not sure what you have seen when you pass by. But inside our centre, we still have some oyster cultures. We do have abalone. Now we are starting more. We are working on mantisri. We work on mud crabs. And we work on gamat, the sea cucumber. So sea cucumber, gamat actually is now the population has dropped. In Pulau Langkawi, they always harvest, take and then make the minyak medicine, right? Minyak gamat, our knee pain, we use it. It's already almost gone. Close to gone, actually. So what we are doing, we study how to culture them indoors. So we understand how we can repopulate back the gamat to the sea. And also at the same time, helping farmers, helping lower income community, how they can actually culture this, sell this, earn some income. So it's a, it's a big um, picture and different species that we are currently working on. Yeah? So we still have some oysters, but some inside. Thank you, Uncle Paul. Uh, one of the lecturers called Bakau, is him still there? Bakau. Mr. Bakau, you take care of that. His, his interest is in the swamp area, the Bakau area. No more. Huh? Remember 20, 20 years ago. I think it's passed away. Passed away, really. <laughs> Forest gun also passed away. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Anna. I think, uh, yeah, I remember uh, when I was doing my, my degree, I actually applied to World Fish Center. Uh, I actually been take a visit to the World Fish Center. That almost that time, they are already doing the abalone fishing, uh, abalone farming research. I, I believe by right by now, it should be very developed. And I believe now, if you buy oyster in Penang, is it farming from? Uh, <laughs> Not a lot. <laughs> okay. So we pass to uh, Dr. Lui. Hello. That's one of the popular uh, question I got about the plant houses or plant houses. Uh, I have personal answer and official answer that my management gave. So I will say the management gave the official answer is uh, last year when I asked the same question to them. So. They say a uh, few years ago, actually not last year, four years ago, we asked a question. Then they always say not enough budget, no budget. Then they drag, drag, drag. Or that year they say they have some other more urgent thing. So they, they, they always say no budget. That's one of the main, main uh, answer. So the second answer they give is they can, uh, not enough manpower to take care. Uh, that one it happened before some people steal or plant inside the plant houses. So uh, that's two issues that they mentioned. Uh, but uh, during this year, we start to open back where they say want to try the response of the public. So they only open one hour in Wednesday. Uh, that early of the this year, early of this year, finally we got some budget for some of our houses. Is finally renovating now. Uh, this year going to be la, or, uh, going to be renovated, and one is under renovation. So uh, they only open one hour in nine to ten. Then I, we we few of us very disagree and okay they now they extend extended and they move it a bit because I, as i know totally come later they won't come and nine is mostly jokers so uh they move to 10 to 12 i think become two hours that's the compromise they gave to me after we discussed with them so <laughs> now it's uh got two plant houses already open uh three 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 plant houses already open so bromeliad uh, and then did you realize that one beside bromeliad is the begonia house the one also open so uh and then uh, like you say the fern house fern house huh? fern house. actually uh this is official answer from them lah. so uh wednesday two hours uh from 10 uh, 10 to 12 then uh, actually if you see the worker is there uh, they can allow you to go in when the workers inside doing maintenance, usually only at the morning, <laughs> as, you, as you know, only, only at the night to 12, maybe if uh, got people there around, then uh, you can ask for their permission, say, can you look around, and you can go in. Uh, that's an offi official answer. <laughs> I have a lot of personal answer. The one we talk later. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so would it be a possible reason that they, they do not allow uh, for a long time because people when they go visit, they might uh, cause some damages? Yeah. Uh, that's the part that they say they say about the no manpower la. so because need to paper to uh, station there to do maintenance of course to also monitor a bit when people coming come out they didn't actually duck out actually it happened before last last year they, they duck out our plant so and then when the staff is not there when they left it open is that guy forgot previous guy like she forgot to lock it when he left. So the next day, the plant is gone. There's a rare plant from Sabah that we got. Uh, so. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, any more questions? Mr. Yeah. Long. Dr. Wei, on uh, this botanical garden, how about the orchid area? Orchid, is it still operating? Looks quiet and close <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> Actually, the one, the Orchidarium, used to be Orchidarium. Now we're going to change to understory forarium for understory plant. Because that site originally is a bad idea that put orchid there. Because most of the orchid are not suitable, they're too wet. Because it's just beside the water waterway. Uh, there's a, uh, too wet for the most of the orchid. Some orchid can take, but not all. Uh, I think less less than 10% of orchid can take that condition. So now we have another orchid house uh, follow Dr. Saul's suggestion previously. So we uh, now have another orchid house, the cactus house, used to be cactus house, and now we're going to be the orchid house. Actually, we already help and like this now I show like 200, uh, now actually we count 221. Uh, inside the inside part, the native orchid one, we already finished. We already helped to set up all the orchid, or two hundred more than two hundred orchid, very cute orchid there. All, uh, but the only thing that they need money to do is the in front part for hybrid orchid because not all are like us that enjoy, enjoy the nature one. Some people like the hybrid one, so the front part they need some budget, and then they drag it few years until now. This year finally they say they got budget. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> uh, so, okay, how going will to be the cactus house there? Because we already have sun rockery up there for succulent plant. So we don't need to repeat two. Then uh, the current orchidarium going to the understory. I just saw the plant that I show you there, uh, some of the, my slide is already planted inside. We already done the lower part. Upper part we haven't do because they promised to renovate the real, the stair, right? And then also the ceiling, uh, the... Uh, roof there so uh this year they on the way doing is uh the project is going on they try to repair back because they, we need people to can go up to maintain the roof and then the real is as people uh, complain that dangerous to the public because the real don't have the uh the walkway like the walkway go up the stair is uh this dangerous so they have to de redo some of it but lower part actually we already set up but unfortunately, the maintenance why I think they still need to upgrade a bit. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that's the uh, current plan. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Rex. Hi, uh, I'm Rexy. Uh, by the way, I'm wearing a Habitat shirt, but I'm not a Habitat staff. I was a previous uh, research grantee. So actually, I found uh, some of the things we said, and I think Dr. Zafe also elaborated a bit more, especially in terms of landscaping, you know, uh, when it comes to usage of pesticides and also the kind of plants they actually plant. And I'm glad to hear that now Habitat or Habitat Foundation is willing to do the trainings uh, in order to train these people who are doing all the general cleaning and landscaping uh, in order to make them aware that uh, biodiversity exists in these areas. But I'm just wondering, one of the things that, things like spiders, and also I think all the more for endemic plants, is like these are sitting duck targets, meaning that if they are there, they are there. And I reckon with spiders also, if they have a burrow there, they are there. So if you were to tell, so I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, number one, if you were to, awareness is important, but to what extent? If you were to tell, say, a contractor that something valuable is there and hence you don't clear it, 
they would be all the more you know motivated to go and uh, you know destroy and then probably pluck it out or something and in my research with orchids also sometimes it's it's between choosing general destruction and someone who is like uh, going there specifically to poach so i think that question to you dr zafe would be how do you do that training or how do you impart that awareness in such a way that it doesn't become a double edged sword then the second question is i think since dr yang you are here as the moderator uh, now that uh, dr zafe dr oi to a certain extent has also explained how important uh, biodiversity and i wouldn't say this is biodiversity in the forest this is semi forested areas where you have some landscape some jungle so you can't say it's uh, hill de troca forest it's biodiversity which exists side by side with us so now that uh, 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 phc and uh, uh, as uh, phb are uh, uh, in your uh, position within phbr you are aware what is uh, your office going to do in order to incorporate that within your landscape guidelines and also whoever the contractors who are coming how are you going to train them so that they are competent to do landscaping for biosphere research yeah i think let's see you answered your question already <laughs> Okay. So yes, I can't be working with the contractors straight. Okay. I'm more of working with the pinnacle preparation because we know that PhD will be telling the contractors where needed grass cutting, where needed to do landscaping, where needed to be cemented, cleared, take down the soil and everything. Right? They're okay. the, they're the boss. I think it's more of telling PhD where are the no go areas, okay. which are the areas that. Should just let the grass grow. Should just let the shrubs do all the, the natural stuff, uh, and which rock don't move. Uh, and then PHC will have. I think a proper guideline by PHC will be will be great uh, in identifying yeah the go and no go areas. Because as you know, just around here near where the most people are on Pinang Hill, there are spiders, there are tarantulas already. Yeah, and it is very sad sometimes when I come in the morning, right, going up, and then suddenly you saw the the spraying the herbicides or pesticides and what they're spraying. Then, alama, they what? There's a barrow there, yeah. so it's good. Yeah. So first, I think the zoning, which you should do it, and then to phase out the use of herbicides and pesticides. I think that will really help. <laughs> A uh, similar thing happened in our garden. We've seen for a small time until now. We keep on stress to the workers that we, like same as your position. Like I show, we are different unit, so I have to go through the process and there that. So we also uh, advise them don't use any more weedicides and uh, uh, chemicals control and. We also have uh, advised the worker reduce the uses, but but at the moment some still using that we tell them to after we tell them that because most of them are from agriculture that they used to use it, so they they don't think of the consequences of on the biodiversity. So this one is the thing that I still fighting for, and then. I stress to them in the meeting. Currently, it's slightly reduced because I show them the directly show the bosses the plant die. You see, <laughs> because some of the gymnosperm palm they cannot tolerate weedicide. When they spray weedicide, the palm die, the tree die. So I directly show them the photo. You see, now, you just set up within two months. You put the weedicide dry. <laughs> I show them. So currently, they some of the part they already reduce, uh, but some of the part that. This is a worker problem. This is a management problem. I have to admit, it's management problem. Um, some worker for for you, if you you hand weeding every day, or you just come in one month spray one time, which one easier? So the worker that leaves, you will go. Oh, I push. Oh, my person answer come out already. So some worker, some worker, they prefer the one month one bush cutter or the team. Ah, then spray easy for them. Uh, or you have to do hand weaving every day. 
Uh, actually, can be done. Every day you do a bit, a bit. Actually, not big area. I mean, for our manpower, supposed to be enough. But for them, they say not enough. They only can come one month, once, two hours. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hui. So for my part, I think PhD the most important actually for our PPD is uh, the safety of the hikers. So, for example, all the places that you mentioned, perhaps there are some hikers who are always uh, walking around. So, for us, what we're looking at is some of the trees, uh, if they are very uh, giving a threat to the hikers, we have to make a way to eat. Right? So, if it's not uh, giving any risk to the hikers, to the people who are walking around, it will not disturb any wildlife. We will just let it and then uh, we will do monitoring as well. So, about the training, um, we believe that we should train kids from young. That's why we have a nature walk, we have a night exploration. But uh, if you if you want them to take the initiative to join uh, along with the parents, um, yeah, it will take some time. But it's in our plan that we will approach to the students, approach to the school and make it a school program that uh, every school will have a number of students um, with the consent of the parents. They should bring them to come here observe and teach them about diversity, about how to do the conservation and hopefully next time you can also go to CMAX. Yeah, that's, that's true but you see, I mean like that is not the target audience who are going to be the next grass cutters. You know? I mean like they would probably be into high paying jobs or whatnot. I think the target audience should be those who are there involved in like landscaping immediate and these Usually they have a very high turnover, meaning that every time a new batch comes, so you train one person, okay, this is what you cut, you don't cut, then by then the next uh, batch comes in. So I think that is something that needs to be always within the, uh, like, you know, when you get, these are probably contractors. So every time the contractor comes in, they should go for the training, what, what to cut, what not to cut, probably a schedule and stuff. So, if I am not mistaken, for cutting grasses, it's not a PhD responsibility, it's from MPPP, right? If, okay, uh, my name is Dona, Dr. Dona, okay, may I have something? Maybe we can have a set of proper guidelines in order to do the maintenance, landscaping, yeah, implant. We might have a proper guidelines regarding, yeah, regarding that, I think. That maybe that best uh, the best thing that we can start off. Yeah. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah, incorporating with all the partners, with all the experts. Yeah. Okay. Similar answer. That's why uh be aware of that, but it's not all duties from us. So it's the same the same questions that you the same uh question that you ask, they have high turnover, but it's not under our responsibility. So we have to deal with the um the management of the MPPP. They have to train the person. But um, yep. after that, whether they can monitor the downstream, the people who are actually running um, hand by hand, um, yeah, they have to do the monitoring. For what we can do is that, okay, your person already done this to our biodiversity, so we only, we only can give the feedback. But from our side, we actually have uh, always will look through. Unless the trees is falling down, clear the way, that's all we do. Okay, we don't purposely cut down the trees. Okay, so any more questions? Uh, thank you. My name is Tony. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Ann a question. Also, Dr. Uh, uh, Ahmad, Ahmad. Ahmad, Dr. Ahmad a question. Uh, Dr. Ann's question is that uh, uh, I don't know whether for uh, not not for Penang State, but for Penang Hill per se, uh, is there a template or is there a precedence elsewhere, anywhere in the world, where we can have a plastic-free environment? Now the reason I say that is because I was in Ladakh uh, in Kashmir and Jammu state for one month for hiking and I'm so glad to say that I've never seen a single plastic bag for the whole month there. Okay? Everything is uh, those uh, those environment friendly bags. That's that's one question to Dr. Ed. So whether there's a template or whether it's something that we can do, not for the state, but specifically for Penang Hill. Okay? It's a small hill, it's not a big area. Uh, for uh, Dr. Ahmad, maybe something uh, simpler is how many species of crabs actually on Penang Hill? Uh? 
roughly lah, no, not not anything. Because I I hike here, you know, I I come across traps, you know, here and there, you know. So uh, that is that is that is one thing. And also, I would like to mention to uh, Dr. Wee is that it's a, it's a very commendable job to keep some specimen and things like that. Because uh, I was in awe when I visited the British Museum and saw the specific specimen collected by Darwin. Very interesting. It gives you a very interesting feeling. <laughs> okay, that's 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 the only, that's the only my questions. Thank you. Okay, so I should go with that. Uh, doctor. Okay, I think your question is very very deep, very relevant. We're talking about a small space. If we can actually come up with a way to stop this plastic pollution, well, I think it has to work two ways. It's not only the management that has to come up with probably a certain set of rules, certain set of guidelines, but also the consumer, ourselves, people who come in. Because you see, even so many places we have no smoking. You see someone standing beside the no smoking sign and smoking. You put a fine, they don't care because there's no enforcement. No one's going to catch me, I'm going to smoke, right? So I think it's in our mindset as well. It is good, I think, if you want to start something, you know, work out, you can, we can come up with all sorts of plans, all sorts of protocols. I want to ban plastic, cannot bring. Even last time, um, I'm not sure if you are aware, but you know the polystyrene, the, the bekas makanan, right? Penang, we don't have. It actually started with a research done in USM, a campaign. We know that polystyrene is bad. So it's great. Penang Island, we don't have polystyrene. But now, if you look at the plastics that we pack our bag, there are indicators what type of plastic it is. If you look, number six, it says PS. It's a polystyrene. It doesn't look like the foam, but it's clear. It's bad. So a lot of things we can do. Um, I would say that many people have to play roles and it will take time. You know, if the management wants to impose certain laws, certain rules, yes, it's great. I think it will be fantastic to start in a small area. But at the end of the day, the consumer also has to play a part. You know, like, you cannot bring plastic, you cannot throw. So I think the, 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 the most critical thing will be see how people respond to no smoking signs. So, yeah, it, it, it's, that's, that's what I think anyway. <laughs> So, so since since we already are biosphere, you know this sort of thing, and you know of course we have all the logos and wonderful logos. Um, what can we do for Penang Hill, let alone the biosphere? Because biosphere area is quite large, you know, and it's, it's practically impossible to control in that sense. Just for Penang Hill, yeah. What can we do for plastic? Number one, you know we have a lot of plastic coming out of Astaka. I mean, I mean to be frank, lah. You know, right? So, so I come back to my example that I was, you know, in, in a place where for one month I never see any plastic, <laughs> and this is a this is a, a, a state, you know, is 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 quite interesting. And I, I I I was told I've never been to Sikkim, for example, in India, where they 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 they, they are basically organic. Okay. So I understand there's uh, economic factors, there are economic pressures, there are you know you know all this sort of thing going on. Uh, but what can we do just for you know? I mean, it's a relatively small area, right? And since we have biosphere, there's all the more reason. You know, I, I don't even want to talk about you know pesticide. That's another another thing about plastic. You know, right? So this is this is something that you know. It's nice to have the biosphere, but this should be a first step for us to move forward and think of further things to, to, do, to do. Because we have uh, actually we have an alliance of hikers uh, group uh, that we are trying to get the message out to face out single use plastic. Okay. In fact, uh, I think if I did with KP twenty twenty before COVID hit. When we did a clean up with one of the hikers group on a small stretch of uh, jeep track, okay, and uh, I can say that we issue a notice that there will not be any single use plastic bottles, okay, 
and we clean up everything and then we have a big bottle to refill all the water bottles for all the people who participated. But uh, if you ask KP, he will tell you that he actually got a scolding for not providing water for the for the, for the volunteers. <laughs> so so I will leave it at that. Okay, but I think the message seems to come across that you know, you know. And, and another thing I want to mention about plastic is t-shirts. Okay, so some it, it, to me last year it was quite a contradictory to have a trash-free event, and yet we had something like over a thousand t-shirts, you know. Okay, so in front of Dato, in front of a sea of blue, I just refused to wear the t-shirt. Okay, so this year I think they cancelled the t-shirt. Okay, so what can we do to push this agenda forward in terms of getting rid of some amount of plastic? We are not idealistic to you know get rid of everything, but some amount of significant controllable source of plastic. For example, coming out of Astaka. Okay. I'm not against any business or whatever, but you know we have to be viable. Yes, I understand, but we have to think of this aspect as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, any more to answer? <laughs> okay. So about the plastic, um, I believe I agree to Dr. Anna. Mentality from young is very important. The thing is, uh, people use plastic as a convenient, cheap of course is one of the, the main factors. Uh, as a business runner. Taking the plastic cheap, fast is the easiest way. But for us, if you want to promote plastic, you go for biodegradable plastic, which is a little bit costly. Does it sound uh, environmental friendly? Not at all. Because bio bi uh, biodegradable plastic is also causing microplastic. So it's not a, a good way. So another thing, then you move to paper. People say paper not environmental friendly. Even you use tissue, people say not environmental friendly. So. Before we can come up with any way to stop totally from using plastic, we need to give them a way of using plastic. Okay, um, maybe we can promote people to bring your container, but we are tourist side, we, we have people from all over the countries. So they are not aware that, oh, then you need to bring container to go and eat. So we can't do that. Same thing like the hikers who walk in the hills, uh, they might be also foreigners who just came here for one or two days, one or two weeks, suddenly have the click, I want to go and hike in the hill. So they just prepare. But then the conveniency is that I don't bring the big bottles. Okay, I go in, bring small, small bottles. As I walk, I drink, I throw up, I reduce my weight. So that is the method. So all this somehow, sometimes is a reason, but it's the fact that we cannot change. But for us, for Penang, we can only uh, guide our students from young, what you can do. Give them a I, I think what I'm talking about is, for example, the source of plastic coming out from Astaka. Yeah, Astaka. Just simple. Okay. Really, just a simple thing. Yes, I think that um, what you have mentioned is really true. Maybe an example, like if you know Hin Bus Depot, they have a market there every Sunday. I think they are doing quite a good job of eliminating single-use plastics. So it's like, it's a matter of maybe the top management, do you want to do it or not? Sometimes people at the bottom, we, we have a lot of ideas. We talk about it, we want to do something, but when it goes up, sometimes it just gets shut down. Maybe budget, it may be, you know, all sorts of things. But it is not impossible. So I think people like yourself, you come up with, you know, you've seen things outside. So we have to, I think, talk about it, bring it to higher management, try to convince them, I guess. So like Hinbas Depot, they can do it. They don't give you plastics. They use paper bags, um, paper boxes, no forks. They use the, the wooden one. So it's just a small space. But I think it's all in the management and how they want to run, what you want to do. So if we really think, if we put our hearts to it, we can actually achieve yeah, with the support of everyone, different um, stakeholders. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so I think we already almost the time. So shall we close the session? Yes, yes, one short answer. Uh, on the crab. Yes, please. On Penang Hill, we have three different species of crabs. And all are endemic. Nowhere else to be found but in Penang only. Uh, one is the big one. 
Uh, now I forget the scientific name. It's a big one, lah. Stolizia. Ah, Stolizia. Ah, Stolizia. Okay, so this is the big, the biggest one. It's around four to five cm. The adult. It stays in the bigger streams and bigger the rivers and also waterfall. But during cool weather like this, they can come out on land. We we have recorded in our park the habitat. Uh, people have seen it at Bellevue as well. They. For any time, yeah, they'll be walking, uh, coming up from the streams. And then number two is Geosesama pinangensis. There's no common name. Uh, it's more of, it lives in Lubang Lubang by small streams. Uh, you, you can find them. Brown color. Uh, just, just very small. Uh, 3cm adult. Uh, then the third one is the Jesusama Faustum. Lah. They can only be found 700 meters and above in stagnant waters of plants like bromeliad, uh, ferns, aeroids, gladi and all that. And anything that collects water. Uh, so those three. And there's one with a very sharp view of them. So that's like oh, got this must be the Stolizia lah, the big one. Stream crab lah, stream crab. Okay, thank you everyone. So, if there's no more questions, I think uh, today we can end the session. Thank you very much thank everybody you. and thank you for our uh, three speakers. And before they leave, we will give them a token of appreciation. to all our speakers, Dr. Yang, Dr. Donna, and all our audience for making this event a success. We hope you enjoyed the, today's talk and have gained valuable insights. Lastly, please help yourselves at the refreshment corner on my right side. Thank you.